This conference will now be recorded. So, uh, in the last class, uh, we discussed about some Linux basics. We talked about some basic commands. Someone is unmute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, in the last class, we discussed about uh, Linux basics. We talked about what are the different basic linux commands how do you create a new file inside a linux operating system how to create a folder how to copy a file from one location to another copy pasting and cut pasting and then uh, man command to see the documentation about any linux commands and then right like that we have seen different different commands cd command that will take you to a folder i think that we did not talk about it today. If you want to go to a folder, there's a command called CD. In Linux, there is a concept called a present working directory. When you are on a Linux command line, you are also working on a folder. So you have a folder that you are currently working in whenever you log into Linux. So it's called present working directory. And you can, you know, you can change that directory whenever you want. You want to go to the folder slash you can go there you want to go to the folder slash home you can go there so you can use the cd command to change your folder and that is something i will show you today we didn't talk about it yesterday and like that we have seen different different basic commands how to delete a file right uh, all these things we discussed how to edit a file add some content right just like how you edit a file in windows or notepad in linux it is possible you can edit a file using nano editor these are the things that we have seen in the last session so today we are going to talk a little bit more about software installation on linux how do you install a software on linux that is what i am going to talk about today so let us start and first of all let me log into the linux machine and uh, yeah, uh, Vida and Samira, we don't set up anything within our laptop. What we actually do is we create a Linux machine in the cloud and from our laptop, we will log into that Linux machine, which is in the cloud. And once you log into the Linux machine, you will get one command line. The command line is what you work when it comes to Linux, right? In Linux, you get only the command line. There is no graphical interface so um, that's what we are doing for the lab environment we don't set it up within our laptops rather we create a cloud machine and to that linux machine you will log in from your laptop you will create it and the video day before yesterday would demonstrate how to do that so you can follow that video and do it that is our lab environment and in my case i already created a linux machine in the cloud i need the ip address of that machine to connect to it so i log into the cloud aws account and get get the ip address of the linux machine first Okay, this is the machine that I created yesterday and uh, currently the machine is in stop state. I'm going to start the machine by selecting the machine and go to instant state and click on start, then the machine will get started. So this is a flexibility that AWS offer. Whenever you are not using a machine, you can stop it. And when you want to use it again, you can start it. So AWS offer this kind of flexibility. So currently the machine is being started and once the machine is started you can log into this machine and whenever you are not using it for example today we started the class and you started your linux machine and after the class you took another two hours to practice and after that you know you are not going to use the machine throughout the day so you decided that let us stop the machine you can just select the machine 
go here and stop it then aws will not count your hours generally it is 24 hours per day if you run the machine throughout the day but if you stop it they will you know you use it only for four hours and stop after that they will count your hours as four not 24 so you save about 20 hours when you stop the machine and about aws free tire they will give you 720 hours per month 720 hours per month actually mean um, if you use one machine and never stop it it's going to become 720 i mean 720 hours means nothing but one month so one machine is free even if you didn't stop it but if you want to create more machines it is a good idea you stop the machine when you are not using them so you will save some time and you can create more machines and at the end of the month it should not be more than 730 hours counting all the machines together that is the free tire of aws so make a note of that uh, something i did not tell you yesterday so yeah so now i have the machine started and running in the cloud and uh, so uh, samira and uh, vida so you will also create similar machine in aws and then you will get the ip address of the machine then from your laptop you will connect to this ip you will log into this machine and then you would get the command line of this machine that is exactly what i am going to do i'm going to log into this machine from my macbook so i'm using a macbook even if you are using windows doesn't matter you can log into the linux machine remotely so that's what i'm doing um, i'm going to run this command ssh minus i feb 24.pem ubuntu at the right ip address sorry in order to log into the machine you need a key file and that's what i am using you will also get a key file when you create a machine in the cloud all right and yeah now i am logged in and as soon as you logged in as the ubuntu user execute this command to become the root user so basically what i did is from my laptop i logged into the remote linux machine uh, and uh, i logged in as ubuntu by default and uh, i want to log in myself as root this is the command you need to execute now you will become root user who am i is a linux command when you run it it would show you which user you are currently logged in as so this command line what you see uh, vida and samira uh, this command line what you see this is not my macbook anymore this command line belongs to the remote linux machine in the cloud whatever command i execute here those commands are getting executed on the remote aws cloud machine makes sense right okay uh, basic small uh, concern like uh, what kind of softwares can we install here basic anything so generally any software that are installable on windows nowadays they can be installed on linux also so any kind of software but okay but usability wise i think it's a little complicated there is no graphical, there is no graphical interface in linux but obviously that is why you have windows linux is not meant to run on your laptop right in your laptop you want to use browsers you want to use lots of graphical stuff so you would prefer to use windows or uh, ubuntu itself has a desktop version with a graphical view so uh, linux is not a uh, operating system meant for laptops linux is an operating system meant for servers where you don't really use graphical interface right but uh, even ubuntu can be installed on your laptop with graphical interface there is a ubuntu operating system with name ubuntu desktop so uh, that has a graphical interface but uh, in our case no ubuntu server is the operating system that we are using it does not come with a graphical interface 
Okay. Thank you. And the truth is that we don't need it. We need only the command line. You install, want to install something, you can install it from the command line. All right, uh, so there's a command called CD and PWD, something I did not talk about yesterday. So PWD is a command you can execute if you want to know which folder you are currently working on. So it will always show you which folder you are currently working on. So I am currently inside the root folder, which is under slash. Slash is the first folder in Linux and inside that slash folder. Right now I am working under the root folder. Now let's say I want to create a new file, right? Using the touch command, touch is the Linux command to create a new file. I want to create a new file with the name test.txt. So I'm running the touch space. Generally, what would I do? Let's say I want test.txt to be created inside slash root. So let me, you know, let me clarify this. Let me draw this up. Assume I have the folder slash inside my Linux machine. This is the slash folder. And inside the slash folder, I have a root folder. And inside the root folder, now I want to create a file or a folder, right? This is the current situation. This is the slash folder. And inside the slash folder, there is root folder. And inside the root folder, I want to create a file with the name test.txt. This is what I am trying to do. So what would be the actual command? I mean, what command would you generally run in such a case? You will use the touch command. Touch is the Linux command to create a new file and touch space slash root slash test.txt. This is the command you would execute if you want to create a create a file with name test.txt at this location. But I'm not doing that. I'm simply running this. Give me one second. Just, just a second. All right, uh, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to execute the command touch space test.txt. I'm not specifying the complete path where I want this file to be created. So in such case, <laughs> Basil, are you sharing something? No, not yet. I'll give me one second. Sorry. Right, so my point here is that I run the touch command and uh, touch space test.txt, but I did not mention the complete path to the test.txt file. By default, it would get created inside slash root. The actual file that got created is slash root slash test.txt. So by default, all the files are referenced based on PWD. You run the command mkdir f1 you know what will happen it will create a folder inside your pwd whatever your pwd is right now right now it is slash root so inside slash root a new folder get created with the name f1 that is what would happen over here a folder got created with the name f1 this is the way how it works got it so there's a concept called PWD in Linux. PWD would be the default folder where one is working. So uh, now I type the command ls. I'm not putting ls space slash root. I'm simply typing ls. That's fine. It will work because by default ls command, if you don't provide any argument, if you provide ls space slash home, 
it's a different story. LS command would show you the content of slash form. But if you don't do that, it would show you the content of your PWD. You run the command nano space test.txt. It will take the file test.txt from the PWD. You use the CP command. You use the RM command to delete a file. So it will always look for a file inside your PWD always. Right? That is the concept, basic concept of PWD. And you can change your PWD if you want to go to a different folder. For example, you want to go to slash home. You can type CD space slash home. Then your PWD will change. CD is the command you can run to change your PWD. Now you are in a different folder. Now you are inside slash home. Now I type ls, I would see the content of slash home. Now I run the command touch basil.txt, then the file that get created will be basil.txt. Or if I run the command uh, test.txt, the file that get created test.txt would be inside slash home. I can see that. I want to go to the folder Ubuntu, which is within my PWD. I don't have to specify slash home slash ubuntu i can simply run cd space ubuntu that will take me to that folder now my pwd has changed now if i try to create a new file called basil.txt it get created inside the ubuntu folder so you can you don't really need to remember the complete path all the time you can use the relative path which is a more convenient way of working right it is more convenient, but until you become comfortable on the Linux command line, that is what I want all of you to become. Become comfortable with the Linux command line. Until you become comfortable or for this entire week while you do your assignment, make sure that you use the complete path all the time without using this uh, relative path. That would you know, help you uh, become comfortable with the command line soon that is why but in real time you don't have to you can always you know reference the file like this this is easy right touch space basil.txt or touch space you know the complete path of basil.txt you would always prefer to use the simple file names all right this is for your information you can do this there is a concept of pwd on linux and cd command will change your pwd does that make sense is it clear yes basil okay and uh, uh, so uh, start with the linux assignment from yesterday uh, if you haven't started yet that is very very important it's not about by hearting lots of linux command right i keep repeating it because it's so important making yourself comfortable with linux is very very important throughout this training because we are going to use linux in all training i mean throughout this training we are going to use linux maybe in kubernetes we don't have to but generally you still you know we use command line a lot so make yourself comfortable run lots of commands eventually you will get used to it and uh, don't try to buy heart it you will eventually buy heart them try to solve the problem by searching in google or by you know uh, trying the man command try to find out the command when you need them rather than by hearting them that is the way of working in linux right uh, so it will take a week it will take 50 commands so do run all 50 commands and and you know uh, try to try to become comfortable right it's a little boring and believe me this is only boring part in our training all right okay and it must be done it's very very important all right, uh, so uh, we are going to a new topic, installation. We are going to install some software in 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 the Linux command line in the Linux machine. All right. So, what is the software again?
what is a software software is a set of program is it yes it is software is a set of program that's what essentially what a software is it contains a lot of program and when you work on a software you you keep executing some program actually that is what happening in the background you don't care about it you let's say you want to use microsoft word you double click and open it and you type in something you save it then you exit it right every time you do some action like this in the background it is some programs that actually get executed so microsoft is a software a word is a software that is developed with lots of programs or instructions that's what a software is and microsoft word has provided you a beautiful ui or beautiful user interface so that you can forget about the underlying programs which is great which is a great thing that's how a software should behave if you are developing a software for your customer you should make sure that your customer don't need to bother about working about the programs or working fixing the programs that should not be your customer call that should be your call you give the software to the customer like a plug and play kind of thing right they just install it and they can start use it with a proper graphical interface or even or a command line interface that's also fine but it should be easy for your customers that is the main concept of having uh, having a uh, using a software customer always prefer a plug and play and whenever they want to install a software i mean how you generally install a software on windows you will download the exe file you double click right you configure it you know by clicking next 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 and at the end software got installed so what you give them is an exe file so customer don't have to worry or bother about the underlying program you provide them an exe file they just double click and then next 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 and software got installed inside their laptop they don't need to bother bother much about the underlying programs developed by your developers right so that is how it should be that is the way of developing a software and giving it to your customers and in case of linux also it is the same process when you want to install a software on linux you will get an executable file and you will run that executable file and it got installed on your linux operating system or ubuntu operating system the particular linux that we are using is ubuntu like that there are different linux flavors in our case we are using ubuntu so in ubuntu you want to install a software you will get an executable file you will execute it inside ubuntu that's all so i will talk a little more about it and yeah one good thing with ubuntu you don't really have to download the exe file and install it that is also automated all you need to do is tell ubuntu what is the software that you want to install it will download from internet it will execute the file it will install the software so you don't have to bother about downloading the file and executing it in windows that is the case you download the exe double click and click next 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 and software get installed in case of ubuntu that process is also automated right so i will talk more about it let me let me show you in a more uh, graphical way so you will clearly understand so assume this is your ubuntu server like a computer a computer that is running an ubuntu operating system and you want to install a software inside this machine that's what you want to do 
so that is your ubuntu server and in that machine you want to install some software for example python you want to install python software inside this machine and over the internet there are n number of repositories n number of repositories are out there over the internet again they are nothing but some some kind of surveys which which we generally call the repositories and there may be one or more than one you know there are maybe n number of repositories out there so these different different repositories contains the exe file different different exe files right uh, those are the repositories which contains the uh, actual exe files one exe file for ubuntu i mean for php another exe file for python another exe file for you know a different software so whatever softwares are out there on the internet you know you will find a depth file that's what you call it a depth file Uh, just like exe file in windows when it comes to ubuntu it is called a dev file similar to exe file it is a package installable package anyone who has a dev file they can run it on their ubuntu server and install the software and these repositories out there on the internet contains lots of dev files belongs to different softwares google chrome has a dev file python has a dev file PHP has a dev file. So all the software available or installable on Ubuntu has a dev file. And uh, this is the file that your Ubuntu server need to install a software. Just like this is similar to the MSI installer on Windows. Great. So inside these machines, which contains different, different dev file, Your Ubuntu server will connect to it and download the needed dev file from there. That is what happens. So every time you try to install a software, what your Ubuntu server does is it will connect to one of this repository, download the necessary dev file from there, and then install that inside your. So for example, you want to install PHP on your Ubuntu server. What you will tell your ubuntu server is that there is a package there is a software called apt apt is a software that will automate the in all kind of installation on ubuntu so you will tell apt that i want to install php php is what i want to install inside this machine then what your apt does is it will connect to the remote machine which contains the depth file of php so assume the inside this repository there's a depth file for php and then apt will download that file from here download the file inside the machine and then it will execute that depth file inside the machine and as a result php get installed inside your machine this is exactly what happens when you try to install a software on ubuntu and this is how you install a software on ubuntu makes sense so these repositories contain lots of dev files and these repositories are managed by different different companies different communities different open source foundations right in linux it's you might have heard linux is free or linux is open source what does that mean linux is does not belong to a single company linux belong to everyone linux belong to the community if you want to become a developer in linux you can start developing linux yourself you have that permission you can get the code in which linux is written in you can modify the code you can customize linux according to your requirement so linux is not just free 
Linux is open source to everyone. I mean, you can get the code. Every, you know, every kid in the world can get the code and work on the code. And they will, you know, you, you find some issue in Linux, you can fix it yourself and you can tell that to the proper people and they will take your fix and apply into the Linux if the fix is proper, of course. And any software that you install on Linux, most of them are open source, free software. So Linux has established a, a freedom for everyone. Not only the Linux operating system, any software uh, in the world, uh, you know, uh, right now there is a, uh, you know, there are huge amount of software that you can use for different, different purpose. They are also open source. You get freedom to work on the software and use them. And, you know, some of these software, you don't develop it yourself. They are already available in the existing communities repository. You just download them and use them. You want to install PHP, you don't have to create the dev file yourself. There's already a PHP dev file available in one of the existing repository. That will, will be downloaded and that will be installed. You want to install Python? Yes, or you want to install any software on your Ubuntu server? You can, your APT get will connect to one of the repository and that repository would contain the executable file in Ubuntu, it's called dev file. It will download the dev file, respective dev file. You know, Python will have a dev file, PHP will have a dev file, Firefox will have a dev file, Ubuntu, I mean, Google Chrome will have a dev file. Every software in the world will have a dev file, and that dev file will be downloaded and it will get installed. And that is what APT will automate. APT is a utility that is uh, available on your Ubuntu server, and APT will automate this whole process. I will show you. I will definitely show you. So, any questions so far on this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, Soumya. So, Your voice is not audible. Um, Hello. Uh, you are not audible, Sami. Yeah, Hello? now you are. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, now you are not. Uh, Sami, I think there is some audio problem. Yeah, basically, like a uh, uh, small concern, like uh, what does uh, mean uh, APT will do? It's a utility, you said, right? It will be by default, it is installed on Linux uh, machine or uh, exactly. So, APT is uh, by default available on Ubuntu operating systems, and you can tell APT to do the job. I mean, APT is the thing that will do this job of installation. So, you tell APT that I want to install PHP. It will connect to the repository that contains the PHP dev file, download it and install it. You tell APT to install Python, APT will connect to that particular repository which contains Python, download Python dev file and install it on your Ubuntu. So any software that you want to install on Ubuntu, you tell APT to do that for you. APT will download, connect to the remote repository, download the respective dev file, install it on your ubuntu so all the things happen at one shot yeah it's a kind of one command or uh, apt it's a command <laughs> so you will run one window command, uh, apt get install then the package name then it will do the rest okay okay Yeah, Soumya, you are asking. Soumya, can you text me uh, in the chat? Hello, hello. There seems to be some audio problem, Soumya. Can you send your question in okay. the chat? Okay. Okay, so, uh, cool. I got struck. One second. I need to log in again. One second. Thank you. 
Okay, yeah. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, now I am logged in uh, back to the Linux uh, Linux command line and uh, you know, using apt now I want to install a software on my Linux server. So I run this command first apt get update. What apt get update command does is I told you apt is a utility in Linux using which you can install any software. apt get will connect to the repository, download the dev file and install it for you. And what are the repositories that apt connects to? Right? There are certain number of repositories that apt, I mean, there are you know thousands of repositories in the world, but your Ubuntu would be connected to only certain repositories. To download the packages so you can configure that inside apt you can tell apt that this is the list of repositories that apt is supposed to connect to you can do that so apt will then connect only to those repositories to download the packages and in order to do that what you do is there is a file called you know there's a file at this location inside slash inside the slash folder uh, etc folder there's a file called uh, inside apt folder there's a file called sources.list and inside this file inside this file you can specify what are the list of repositories their http urls they can be connected using HTTP. All these repositories can be connected using HTTP. So you specify the HTTP URL of all these repositories inside this file. Then apt get will reference this file to understand what are the repositories it need to connect to. Right, and that is exactly what I am going to show you. I'm going to show you this file. Come on. I got uh, okay, it's working. There's some connection problem, you know. Every time I get this, there's a some connection glitch. That's why I'm getting disconnected off the terminal. Sorry for that. All right. Uh, so I'm back. Uh, and if you open this file in a nano editor slash etc apt sources dot list, if you open this file, what you will find is a number of URLs mentioned inside this file. All the lines that begin with hash. Don't worry about them. All those lines that does not begin with a hash, they are the actual commands, uh, they are the actual configurations. So there are different different repositories. There are a number of repositories that is mentioned over here by default. You don't have to worry, worry much about this file. The default configurations will work fine. But if you want to modify it, you can modify it. You want to add a new repository or you want to remove an existing repository, you can do it. Right, what I'm talking about is over here. If you want to delete this repository and then add a new repository, all you need to do is go to the sources.list file and remove that line and add the new line of the new URL of the repository. URL of the new repository. So Every time you run the apt get update command, so uh, you have the sources.list file that apt always reference 
to get the list of repositories and when whenever you run a command called apt-get update what apt-get update command does is it will check the list of repository connect to each and every repository and do a check i mean it will check what are the packages available there what are the softwares dev files available in each each of those repositories what are the versions so it will do a complete checking of the repo so this command will connect to each and every repositories one by one you can see repository one repository two repository three, repository four in real time it is it is actually more than four i believe in your case it would be somewhere around 40. so it will connect to each and every repositories inside this file and make a note make a note what is in there so once you run the apt get update command now your apt get know where is php and where is python where is firefox right maybe this is the repository that contain php this repository contains python and this one contain a different software so every time you run the command apt get update inside your ubuntu machine it will connect to each and every repository and make a note what are the dev files available there and next time when you try to install a software then you know it's a guarantee that you are connecting to the right repository and downloading the right file so apt get update command until you run the apt get update command you know apt get have some confusion which package is available in which repository what are the versions of each packages so all this confusion get resolved whenever you run the apt get update command so it is a good idea that you run the apt get update command frequently to keep your apt up to date today i run apt get update command and maybe after that some change happened in one of the remote repository for example this repository contains php dev file and php now released a new software version previously it was php 7.2 and today they released php 7.4 new version of dev file but your apt get is not aware until you run the apt get update command so you know uh, you should every time you run apt get update command your apt would become up to date about the information of the remote repository so it's a good idea you run the apt get update command frequently so that you know it, it can apt get would keep itself up to date so that is exactly what uh, i have just done once i run apt get update now my apt get is aware what is going on in the remote repository so i'm going to run this command apt get install apt get install is the command you will always use whenever you want to install a software so i want to install python so the command would be apt get install python so then what actually happens this is the only command you need to execute if you want to install python it is as simple as that run this command now what happens is you know basically apt get will connect to the repository which contains the python dev file then it it check that package then it noticed that actually python cannot be installed along there are many things that python depends on and then it will give you a final list i cannot just install python alone because python depends on these many software or these many packages all these packages need to be installed do you want to continue so i say yes y for yes and press enter then what happens is all these packages get downloaded and installed along with python so python is installed on my linux machine it's it's beautiful your apt get not only install your software your apt get will check the dependencies of the software and install everything that python need at one shot that is the case with software most of the software depends on other packages so to work one software first you should install the other one 
you may have experienced this problem in windows in ubuntu apt get know each and every software what are the dependencies of that software it will tell you these are the total list of packages to be installed if you want python to be installed properly so that's what i did i installed the packages whatever is needed for python to work properly it's a single command that you always run every time you install a software basil but if you type apt minus get update uh, but it doesn't in that command it is not showing any um, url related to the python right but uh, how come uh, you install that one basil there is no, probably there is no dedicated python url one repository contains different different packages one repository may contain 100 packages other repository contain 200 packages one of them is python so uh, aptget does not simply check the url aptget update command will connect to each and every repository and check inside the repository what is there what are the dev files available within that repository? That is what apt-get update command will check. But initially, if you type that command, it is not showing. Uh, that's what my understanding. It doesn't show any uh, um, URL related to Python, right? You, uh, my point here is that, OK, OK, this is the command. Yeah, it, it connected to all 40 repositories and it it updated itself, not for its 40. Yeah, it does not display Python here. Uh, will it yeah. display Python here? No, no, that is a concern I'm having. Yeah, right. And my point here is that yes, one of the repository have Python and once you run the apt get update, you are able to get know which repository has python so there are total 40 repository what apt get update does is it will scan each and every repository what are the dev packages available in each and every repository so you won't see anything in the output for sure but once one thing is for sure once you run the apt get update command now your apt is aware which one of this 40 repository contains python dev file and that's what you care about you don't care much about what is beyond no but seeing the output uh, how could you know that where it is a uh, where is the python dev file in the particular url uh, this from output you will not see that is what my point is the output would simply show you the name of the repositories that's all okay uh, uh, are you getting my point so how many packages would be available in one repository no no that that is i understand but as a layman uh, no, suppose if want, i no the answer is you want right you want and get to know that yeah I, yeah, if I would like to, for example, if I would like to install Microsoft uh, uh, Word or something, by seeing that list, how could I know that? Where is whether it? You want. And the answer is you want. But there are ways to find out. These repositories are public. You can go to that URL from your browser. You can check the packages in each and every repository. Uh, but uh, apt get update command you know if you want to manually find out right you can go to this url on your browser and you can see all the packages that are available in this particular repository you can take a look at them uh, apt get update will once you run it it will it might have that information what is available in which repository um but uh you did uh apt um 
get python for installing python right not uh, update command uh, first i run the update command it is the update command that that will make sure that my apt get is aware of what is inside the repository so it is mm -hmm. always recommended that you run the apt get update command first before you install any packages so before oh, installing okay. python the first thing what i did is i run apt get update my now my apt is aware what package is there in each repository then i run okay. the apt get install python so now i know that apt will will, will do right apt get will do it right because okay. it is up to date i run apt get update command before uh, so basically hello yes for me uh, so this uh, like uh, uh, before uh, installing any package or software we always need to run this apt apt get update command so we yes, don't sir. have any notification just like any facebook time like in every seven days or 15 days that it will, will receive a new version kind of one so not notification kind of thing uh, uh, we make it as a practice yeah uh, you won't get notification and um, that uh, these are the uh, things uh, the command line don't have so okay. uh, but you know that every time you run the apt get update command you you become up to date But again, remember when you run the apt get update command, what actually happens? Apt get update command will make a note. Make a note what is in there in the remote repository and it don't do any change inside your machine other than you know uh, creating a cache, creating a simple cache, and then inside the cache, apt get will write down in first repository these are the packages available you know there are some uh, 15 packages available in the first repository in the second repository there are uh, 35 25 in the third repository there is 75 or 70 so every time you run the apt get update command on ubuntu so me can you mute yourself noise is coming so me can you mute yourself I think Minali, it's here from your side. Can you mute? Yeah, yeah uh, the point what I'm trying to make here is that uh, the apt get update command will connect to each repository one by one, make a note of what are the packages inside, and it will keep an information in the cache. So next time when you run the install command, install Python, so uh, apt get already figured out which repository contains python maybe the third repository out of 70 packages one of them is python so it understood that this is the repository that contain python it will connect it to that repository and download python and all the dependencies from there maybe the dependency would be in a different place whatever right it just download everything and install it for you this is what happened and Srirang, this concept is clear, right, for you? I understood your question. Is this yeah, yeah, that is, a, uh, as a layman, how could we know that what what is there inside the repository? You can directly check the repository, go to the URL in the browser, you can check, it's possible. Yeah, so okay. That okay. can be done. Uh, Basil, if we... Uh, uh, Type this uh, apt get python, apt install uh, python. So it is installing 2.7. Uh, so how we can uh, install other version as well? Uh, for Python 3, the package name can be different, or along with apt get install command, we can actually specify the version also. And I believe in case of Python, uh, Python 3 is a different package actually. If you want to install Python 3, what what you generally all okay i will i will get into that okay. basically minali here i have a question in case i'm trying to 
install a package which is not available in any of the repository after uh, doing that apt get update also what will apt do in that case a good question uh, it would throw you an error saying that package not found then it would be your responsibility to locate the right package add them into apt sources or list file run an apt get update command Okay, so you just Google about that package and you get a link uh, of the repository? Yeah, that is the right Thank approach. You. And even for installing packages also, generally what you must do is, you should confirm the package name. So in case of, right, what I did is I installed Python. I wanted to install Python 3. What I must do is first, I will search in Google Python 3 ubuntu package assume i want to install python 3 on my ubuntu server the first thing that you should do is you should search in google python 3 ubuntu package and you will get the exact package name to be installed and in case of python 3 the package name is python 3 you copy that and you run the command apt get install and first of all, I am running the command apt get update. Oh, sorry. I need to reconnect. Give me one second. Okay, yeah. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this command apt get install Python 3 if I want to install Python 3. But then I can see that actually Python 3 is already installed and it is up to date, so I don't have to do anything. Or you want to install PHP, you will do the same thing. You will search in Google. Let's say you want to install PHP 7. I search in Google PHP 7 Ubuntu package. Then it will tell you the exact package that you want to install. It is PHP 7.0 or PHP 7.2, right? Whatever version you need, you just mention that and it will get installed. So always search in Google something like this. And the first search result would itself would give you the exact uh, package that you want to use, right? Okay, great. So this is the way. So the only thing what you have to remember is every time you want to install a software, this is what you will do. First, you will run apt get update command then you will locate the package name assume you want to install a software called uh you know anything right java you want to install java so you search in google java ubuntu package then you will get the exact package name that you want to install then you will run the command apt get install package name so the two commands are sufficient for any kind of installation. First, you will run apt get update, then you will run apt get install. This is the simple step of installing any software in Ubuntu. And this is what we will do all the time, right? Every time we want to uh, install a software in Ubuntu, this is the approach we will follow. This is pretty much, you know, more or less what you want to know. 
bus will uh, if we uh, install any software will it keep some uh, will it consume some space uh, in windows generally we download so it will consume so, uh, some space it will consume so, some space and actually you can get to know when you run the command apt get install it will tell you how much space it is going to consume and it's very less right uh, maybe even python as you know it is a complex software it is a programming language right and hardly it, it might take some 40 mb or 42 mb not more than that so uh, space I'm not, uh, yeah. sorry i'm not talking about the uh, installed one uh, i'm talking about the which one we downloaded will it keep anything on that uh, you, you are talking about the depth file. Uh, yeah. Will that get automatically deleted? Actually, yes. Uh, not automatically. When you run the command auto clean, there's a command called apt get auto clean. What this command does is it would clear everything from the cache. Those downloaded depth file would be cleared from the cache. Uh, there is a command that you can execute to do that. Yeah. Good question. Uh, yeah. so, so. so you need the depth file only for the installation, right? I mean, the question what Abai is asking, you downloaded the depth file, apt get downloaded the depth file, and then installed the package. Do you need the depth file anymore? You don't need them anymore. That can be deleted. So apt get has a mechanism to clear the cache frequently. The command is apt get auto clean or auto remove, but that will also do the same thing. All right. So only we need to find out the installable file name so that we can give it in the uh, apt command, right, Basil? Exactly. It is to be precise. It is called a package name. That's what that's the technical term for this. Yeah, you will find the package name and then yeah, you will use it along with a get install. Okay. Okay. Great. So yeah, uh, and actually APT is not a topic that we need to remember a lot. Uh kind of you know, we, we will be using APT get only for the installation but uh, we are going to do lots of installation that is why i wanted to explain this how apt get works and right, related things so the next the most important topic so we are done with linux basics i'm not get planning to get much into linux basics anymore so we will go into some some bit advanced topic software web applications so we are going to set up a web application on linux i mean does not mean that we stop working on linux it is linux we are going to work on throughout the week but we are whatever topic that i am going to teach from now you need them throughout this training okay we are going to start the prerequisite training from now. So we talk about software, web applications. We talk about how to run a website on a Linux machine. What is Docker, right? There are certain things that you need to understand before we start our advanced training. And that is what we are going to begin right now. It means whatever I'm going to discuss from now are extremely important. That's what it means. All right. So first we will start with, uh, I'll ask some question to you, you know, I, I also need some answers. Uh, okay. So let's, let's talk about this. Uh, so assume you have your computer. I mean, the answers can be wrong. It can be right, doesn't matter. Assume you have your computer and you want to browse for a website, let's say google.com. 
so how does your browser will download the google.com files to your computer any idea it, it will connect to the respected server and it will get it downloaded right so it will connect to some server on the internet of course you know that if you want to browse google.com you need internet right so through the internet your browser will connect to some machine out there on the internet and it will download the google.com web page from that machine this is what happens when you browse google.com in your browser this is exactly what happens and this machine as you can assume how a public ip what is mean by public ip any machine in the world that has a public ip yeah anyone what is a public ip address of that uh, machine address of the machine on the internet so public ip is unique if a public ip is assigned to any machine in the world that ip address belongs to that machine and anyone in the world your browser or you from any part of the world try to connect to that ip you will be always connecting to the same machine the machine which call how that ip right now like your aws machine when you create your aws machine in the cloud it get a public ip remember and from your laptop you will log into that aws machine how is that even possible your aws machine has a public ip anyone in the world try to connect to that ip it's getting connected to the right machine your aws machine it's not just your case you are sitting in bangalore machine machine is in virginia or machine is in uh, ireland it doesn't matter as long as the machine have a public ip you can connect to that machine got it so that's what mean by public ip so uh, another question does your laptop have a public ip any idea no. on that but no uh, uh, will get connected to gateway through nat yes yeah so your laptop don't have a public ip in other words let's say your friend who is sitting in in his home you know from his laptop he want to connect to your laptop technically is it possible from the internet is it possible the answer no. is nobody can connect to your laptop your laptop don't have a public ip or you can say a visible ip a visible ip from the internet so no your friend or somebody sitting outside your home cannot connect to your laptop in direct networking ways there are ways to do it i'm, I'm saying there is no physical connection from your front computer to your your computer but that is not the case with your computer and this assume this is the aws machine right for example so you took the internet connection from from let's say from airtel you have the internet connection taken from airtel in your home so what airtel had done is they have created a they have a router they have a router in bangalore assume you are sitting in bangalore and from that router they connected a cable to your modem device so you have a modem device in your home um, yeah so assume you have a modem device in your home and what airtel does is they will connect a cable to your modem device and then your laptop is connected with the modem device and this is exactly how it works right the setup in your home and this is a router of airtel that is sitting in bangalore and maybe it has a physical connection to another router which is sitting in mumbai 
this is another router that is in mumbai and then that will connect to another router which is in which is in the in europe probably this is not airtel router this is uh, this is a router that belongs to some isp uh, within ireland and then it will connect to another router which is probably in the us and assume the isp is at and and assume this machine is sitting in us then probably it will physically connect to this machine using the public ip of this machine so there is a path from your laptop there is a proper path that it takes to connect to the remote machine and it is only possible if the remote machine has a public ip right this is only possible this kind of physical connection from you a right connection can be through the cable or wireless or whatever there is a physical connection your laptop can connect to this machine if the machine has a public ip this is the simple meaning of public ip but in your home it's a different case none of your computers are directly connected with router your computers are connected with the modem but not with the internet routers in your home things are a little bit different so you have you know you have a laptop and then you have a phone right like that you have different different devices within your home so you have you have two laptops and you have two mobile devices inside your home and all these devices are connected to the same wi-fi so forget about the server i will come there in some time let's assume this is your home where all these devices are connected to a wi-fi router assume this is a wi-fi router and uh, all the devices are connected to this Wi-Fi router. What actually happens then is each device would get an IP address. Both your laptop and both your mobile devices would get an IP. And that IP address is called a private IP. Private private IP address. Every machine would get an IP. A private IP and using that IP they can communicate each other because they are in the same network you know the same Wi-Fi provides the network services and all these devices are in the same network yes they can communicate each other even if you don't have internet right you don't need internet assume this is the Airtel router which is in Bangalore and from that Airtel router they had connected this cable and assume this cable is unplugged that means you don't have internet still as long as the wi-fi is on all your mobiles and laptops are connected to wi-fi inside your home a network get formed a private network and using the private ip all these devices can communicate each other you want to transfer a file from your laptop to your phone you might have noticed it's very fast i mean if you used some some mobile application like sender or some wi-fi related applications if you use them you will see that you know it it transfer very fast you know one gb file get transferred within within seconds the reason is it is actually direct transfer they are connecting to each other directly within your home without the need of in that much so this is called private ip and your laptop only get the private ip but still you are able to connect to internet how is that possible because your modem does some kind of trick you know making you look like you are a part of internet to the people all over the internet you know they will feel that you are actually part of the internet because your modem does some kind of trick i'm not going to get into that it's called nat natty i'm not going to get into that this is not our concern i just wanted to give you a brief idea about what is private ip and what is public ip let me ask you this question does your modem get a public ip assume your uh, airtel 
has a router in Bangalore and from that uh, router, they pulled a cable and connected on your modem device. Your modem is directly connected with internet, make a note. And it might have a public IP as well. Based on the configuration that your internet service provider had done, but possibly, yes, your modem may have a public IP, a dynamic IP, but not every machines inside your home, they get only private IP. Only your modem get a public IP. So this is how the networking works, you know, just wanted to give you an overview. And over the internet, the communication happens between public IPs. The internet or the router of Airtel does not know any private IPs. I mean, it does not bother about the routers all over the world, routers created by Airtel or uh, AT&T or, you know, they work together, right? That is why the internet is formed. Airtel may, have, not, may not have presence in Mumbai, but Tata may have presence in Mumbai or ACT have presence in Bangalore. So this different, different routers located all over the internet. Airtel may not have a connection on US. It is their ISP in the US. So there are lots of router devices and cable that are connecting them, right? Connecting them together. So there are routers and actually all this router does not belong to one company. The routers belong to different, different companies and they work together to form proper networking uh, or which you call the internet. Makes sense. This is how internet is formed. And these routers only know the public IP. I mean, they have no idea about private IP at all. You tell this router, I mean, assume this is your computer right? you are from your home. You are connecting to this router. Assume this is the Airtel router in Bangalore. And from your laptop, a connection arrive at this router. This router will ask you what is the IP it is coming from and what is the IP it is going to. Right? The IP it is coming from the modem IP. The IP it is going to is the remote machines public IP. Both has to be public IP. And you know, a router will understand only public IP. So any connection traverse through internet. It is a public IP to public IP communication. These internet or these routers, they don't know about anything about private IP, right? Private IP is only for your internal communication purpose. So your browser in your laptop connects to some server on the internet that has a public IP, google.com server maybe the server which are set up by the google.com company. This is a server that belong to Google company and your browser will be connecting to this machine and downloading the web page from there. And that is when you see a beautiful, good looking website displayed on your browser. And you search for something in Google, you search for some keyword and click on Google search button. Then again, your browser will submit that information to the server. It would send that search keyword to the server. What server does is it will take the keyword, whatever you entered in the browser, it will then execute some program here, you know, to get the search result and it will collect the search result and then send the search result back to the browser and that is when the browser will display the search result so every time you do some action in the browser what actually happens is a server to client communication is what going on this is how a web application works so our plan would be just like google.com we are going to set up our own website on a machine that has a public ip do you know any machine that has a public ip our aws server our aws machine yes so our plan for tomorrow would be we will create such a machine with a public ip in aws we will set up a website there and the browser all over the world 
can connect to our AWS machine and you know get the web page from our AWS machine. This is the plan for tomorrow. A very very important class, and this is something we will uh, we will be using throughout the training. This is not only for tomorrow. Whatever I am discussing from now is for our entire program, right? So this is going to be our AWS machine that we will use to set up some website, make it browsable for people all over the world. That's our plan for tomorrow. And you have class this Saturday. Generally, you don't have class on Saturdays, but this Saturday, since we are beginning this week. Uh, so Friday in the US, Saturday in India, Friday in the US. All right, so any questions, anyone? And those who don't have access yet, please talk to your contact person and get access. And starting from tomorrow, you might want to watch the videos one more time because it's a pretty new topic what we are going to discuss from tomorrow. I wouldn't say it's difficult, but I would say they are totally new to you. Whatever topics we are going to discuss from tomorrow, they are totally new. So you should really expect, uh, you know, a little amount of time or maybe when you watch the video one more time, uh, more things would get, you know, get clarified. So it is advisable starting from tomorrow for next three days, uh, tomorrow and next three days, whatever classes we are conducting, take some time, watch the video one more time, that will help. And yeah, any questions? I was actually expecting a lot of questions for today. Anyone? Is it clear whatever we discussed about the private IP and public IP and why I am planning to set up the website on the AWS machine, not in my laptop? Is it clear? Yes, sir. Clear for me. Yes. Cool. Cool. Awesome. So let's you know let's wind up for today and tomorrow we will continue at the same time. A poll. Uh, so I see you. Uh, this is your first class, right? Yes, this is Pallav here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what's your background? So yeah. Uh, so like uh, currently I'm working in the Salesforce CRM side on okay. the cloud, and I wanted to go into the AWS and uh, AWS with uh, DevOps on the security okay. side as well. Okay. Cool. So when did you join? Actually, I did not notice that you joined. Um, I think our it, training is not completely AWS. It is a DevOps related course. AWS is part of it. We use AWS for lab environment and we use AWS for explaining the uh, Docker and Kubernetes orchestration. Uh, but uh, it's not a dedicated AWS training, though I have a uh, self-paced AWS course. Yeah, but I was also looking for DevOps plus AWS, so that's fine. Got it. Got it. Awesome. And, and if, uh, anything, did, did I miss anything? Is it the second class or third class? This uh, technically it is the third class, uh, but yesterday is when we started with the Linux basics. Yesterday was the only technical session. The day before yesterday, we were discussing about creating AWS account and a Linux machine. So if you already know how to do that, you can skip that one. And yesterday was the first uh, Linux basis we started from yesterday. And th then there is a demo class. A demo class is uh, all about what is our course list, what is our roadmap, and everything. So that was discussed uh, on Monday, Sunday in the US. So if you get a chance, watch that video also. I mean, that must be watched, but uh, you can prioritize yesterday's one. Okay, and uh, is there any tools I need to download on my machine, or you of need Kali Linux, uh, Linux, or what we need to download? Uh, on you Linux? need Putty. Uh, do you know how to use Putty? Yeah, yeah. So uh, to log into the AWS machine, we use Putty. Okay. And that is 
your lab environment will be uh, apart from that you don't need anything on your laptop uh, okay so it is only for logging into the cloud server always throughout the training we will be working in the cloud not inside the laptop okay and who is your contact person uh, i think garima garishma okay I talk to her uh, i get access to the recorded videos of yesterday um, and watch it okay. and how do we download the uh, putty like you said and the website is putty.org go to that website and uh, so uh, that is all there in the video day before yesterday's video okay. uh, samira okay. and here you will have to watch both video day before right, yesterday's right. of the lab yesterday yeah video. I said okay. Paul because Paul might already aware of Putty, so okay. he, he can skip one video and watch only yesterday's. In your case, both videos are important. Okay, yeah, because I didn't like I already have an AWS uh, account, but um, like there was this page that you were using. I wasn't sure to get into the Linux how you were using that, so that would be like you will just walk us through in the previous videos, right? Right, that I am going uh, walking you through the previous video, the day before oh. yesterday's video. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sounds good. So and if you are using you... Windows, it's a different software. Uh, in MacBook, you mm -hmm. have this terminal kind of thing. Uh, in Windows, it's a different tool. Uh, so uh, the steps to log into the server is different for Windows and Mac. Once okay. you logged in, you get the right command line, and we all have the same lab environment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. And how many days is the class? Five days or seven days? It will be five days, Monday to Friday, uh, Sunday to Thursday for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, Basil. This is Ramya. Yes, Ramya. Uh, I have some difficulty in practicing uh, Linux commands. Uh, uh, actually, because of the syntax, I think I'm yeah. facing uh, some difficulty. How can I overcome that? Uh, the only way, uh, yeah, that is exactly the point. Is uh, That's what I have been discussing yesterday and today. The yeah. only way to get over that difficulty is to run lots of commands by investigating them yourself and it's little boring process that uh, start with that 20 command and uh, and make sure that you know uh, once you eventually become comfortable with the cd ls touch mkdir command things would improve okay. a little and then you start with the assignment things would improve further okay. It will take okay. about 15 to 20 commands to become, you know, convenient and uh, be able to search for commands and learn them quickly. It would take another 20 commands. By the time you finish 50 commands, you would be capable enough. You know, probably next time whenever okay. you want to learn a new commands, it would take only one minute for you. After that, so, okay. Uh, On uh, different sites, uh, we find uh, I find different uh, syntax that is. Uh, the problem I'm facing. In case of commands, it's only one syntax. Let's say you can run the ls command. T take the ls command as an example. You can run okay. the ls command without any argument. Simply run the ls. That is one way of okay. running command. There will be only okay. command. There will not be any arguments. So the second okay. type is uh, think about this command ls space slash form. Okay. So in this case, you are giving some argument to the ls command so uh, command is ls then you will put mm. a space before you put the folder name okay this is another syntax uh, command with argument and the third yeah. syntax is ls space minus l space slash form so minus l is used as an option it is called option so this option yeah. can ls command to do something differently in case of minus l you know uh, rather than simply displaying the file name display the file name and the modified date the size of the file you know uh, it, it will show in a list format that is what minus l will do so now you got a new syntax the command space option space argument 
So these yeah. are the three possible syntax you will see on Linux. I took the example of ls command. Think about touch also. A touch okay. space touch.txt. It follow the same syntax command space argument. Or think okay. about uh, you know pwd command. You run pwd. So it was a single command without argument. So the only three possible options are when it comes to syntax in Linux is the command along, command plus argument, command option argument, and they all are separated by a space. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Keep that in mind and then okay. try to practice. Yeah, in practice. Thanks. Okay. Cool. And keep doing that everyone who is working Linux uh, for the first time, right? Keep practicing, spend some time on Linux. Uh, do run all the 50 Linux commands. Uh, submit me. I have not got any submission yet, but I am expecting it takes time. Uh, but uh, try to complete it by today and tomorrow, all the 50 Linux commands. Yeah, Samira and Veda, there is an assignment. Uh, that I had given yesterday, you can get to know from the video. Yesterday's okay. video. And and Basil, this okay. is Pallav here. So, is there any commands that we need to practice? Any 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 number of commands? Yeah. Any yeah. list? Watch yesterday's video completely. I had given an assignment. So let me send that 50 Linux command link in the chat. You bookmark it, and okay. you go through it. Once you created the Linux machine, just keep executing these 50 commands one by one. And it is recommended that you watch yesterday's video where we discussed the basic Linux commands. And these are outside the topic commands, whatever I have sent you the 50 commands that is assignment. Okay. Okay. And, and everyone, please submit the assignment uh, once you completed it. I'm expecting by today or uh, maximum by tomorrow, complete all 50 commands. And it takes time, at least for first 15, 20 commands, it takes a lot of time. Each command you will spend about, you know, 15 to 30 minutes to learn it. And it's worth the time, believe me, it is worth the time. After only 20 commands, you are going to become actually faster. And only after 50 commands, you would really become, you know, uh, real fast you will become convenient with the command line right um, mostly the people who work with windows there would be definitely an initial trouble right there is no mouse right uh, in windows it was mouse was good enough for 90 percent of the things and you rarely use the keyboard uh, that is not the case here it has to be keyboard it has to be commands and stuff so you should have a clear understanding about the file system, the path, and everything. So that is why that initial difficulty, it will pass. It will pass soon. All right. OK, yeah, uh, cool. So, so Basil, for this assignment, do we need to submit some here, or we need to send it to your email ID? Submit from the portal. Submit from the .word. There's a submit option. Once you open the assignment, there's a submit option. Submit from there. Yeah, in last line, there is a mention email to the email ID. So I have. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's that's because uh, <laughs> when I prepared that assignment for previous batch, <laughs> there was a problem in Dorward. It was not working. I will, I will remove that. The submit option was not working at that time. Now it is. So use a door word for submitting all assignments. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. So we will continue tomorrow. Tomorrow, same time. So I hope everyone is good. Nimisha, Priyanka, you know, feel free for any question that you may have. Uh, Asmat, Tenjit. Uh, let's, uh, we will continue tomorrow. Tomorrow, same time. Bye. And uh, get Thanks. access by contacting your contact person. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.